Welcome, everybody, to episode number 53. Yes, I said 5-3. Uh, uh, welcome. I'm Doug. Uh, we have Robbie here. Robbie, how are you doing tonight? Doing, doing great. I love the fact that you said the episode number, not the actual name of the show. We are the Sports oh, Blitz. Sorry about that. You know, it's, it's not, We're it's episode not, 53. Not written, down. Yeah. It's not written down. It's episode number 50. If they don't know who we are by now, then we're in trouble. We're after 53 Some people because... may be newly coming out from underneath the rocks, Doug. Oh, you know, the cave, you're the coming cave, out right. of the cave. You know, the cave, they just... Right. You never know. Oh, you never know who's yeah, still so, upon us. Yeah, exactly. So if you're coming out of the cave or you're coming from under the rock, you might want to go back in because it's not time to come out yet. Um, and Listen to are, us first and then, and then go right, on back. Right. Yeah. Well, we are the Sports Bliss. This is, number, uh, this is episode number 53. <laughs> we have a very, 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 how many berries can I do? Very special guest. At least guest 10, tonight. right? At least 10. At least 10. She yeah. deserves at least 10. Yeah. Uh, very special guest. We're very excited to have. Um, and I'm not even going to say who it is yet. I'm just going to, I'm just going to give a little synopsis here. He's a radio DJ. She's a radio consultant, Rush founder. She's a professor, a writer, <laughs> baseball historian, radio historian, and an all around good egg. Want to help her. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much. I love it when you say, we're going to have a great guest tonight. And I'm like, yeah, and she'll be along later. But right now, we have... <laughs> That's right. Who is that guest? Where is that? Yeah, is really. That she, is she Thank you for she... having me on your show. One of the things a lot of people don't know about me is that I've been a baseball fan ever since I was a kid. And many people that know me know me about like Rush and rock and roll. And I was a DJ and blah, blah, blah. But baseball has been a part of my life since I was growing up. And I remember, you know, convincing my father, nobody in my family was a baseball fan. Um, I remember convincing my father to take me to Fenway Park, which is still standing. And um, I just, it was like, I can't believe I'm here. You know, I was just a kid, so I didn't know like the history of the place. I just knew that this was way cool. And it's still to this day, I love just going out to the ballpark. You can't do it now, but there will come a time, you know. So, yeah, so thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to uh, come on and talk a little baseball. I had a wonderful time a couple of months ago on a friend of mine's show, a guy named Bob Busser, who you may or may not know, award-winning Hall of Fame photographer, and he takes photographs of ballparks and stuff like that, but we didn't talk a lot about baseball. We talked some, so this is kind of a real treat for me, and I'm, I'm thank you so much for the opportunity. Oh, absolutely, Donna. We, we um, uh, I go back with Donna to the old Emerson days. I shouldn't say old. It was bad. Uh, the yes, Emerson, no. the Emerson, <laughs> that's correct. The, the Emerson days, um, I took every single class with, with Donna, uh, no matter what class. For those who are I watching out of state, um, <laughs> Emerson refers to Emerson College, which is a school in Boston where people historically that wanted to go into the media, that's where they go. And it's not a trade school. It's an actual college college. But I'm saying it's got a radio station. It's got a TV station. It's got a newspaper. It's, you know, but I'm, it, it had a radio station from 1932 on. So it didn't come late to the party. It didn't just suddenly decide last week. There are generations of trained professionals from all over the country who went to Emerson. And even when I was a radio consultant, I used to teach there before I came to Leslie, before I had my PhD, when I was still working full time in broadcasting before the industry changed and we all ended up on the beach. Um, but the reality is that it was a lot of fun teaching some courses about the history of broadcasting and the history of journalism and et cetera, and et cetera. Because even back then, media history fascinated me and it still does. So yeah, um, Doug was one of my students and boy, look what happened. You know, I mean, 
and now he does podcasts. What can I, I do? Say? I, yeah, we're, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't have any idea. Uh, but it's, no, but we it's, had some fun, cool. though. We had a lot yes. of fun. Because yes, we did. studying the history of the media, to me, is a way of saying thank you. Okay? I mean, these are the people that entertained us, that informed us, that in many cases gave us stuff to think about. And here we are today, and in many cases, these folks are forgotten, okay? Like, I just had a new piece put up on the Sabre website. And for those that are not familiar, that's the Society for American Baseball Research. And I'm a member, one of the volunteers on the Sabre Bio Project. And we write biographies, biographical sketches of people that are famous, people that are nearly famous, people that are not famous at all. But our job is to just make sure that various people are remembered. And my expertise is in the sports writers. Because as somebody who was in media, that's kind of where my heart is. The play-by-play -play people, the sports casters, <laughs> and the sports writers. Oh, by the way, total aside, Vin Scully is now on. I Twitter. saw that, yes. Vin yes. Scully. Yes, Vin legendary Vin Scully. Scully. Okay, I mean, people are sitting there going, oh, um, <laughs> Vin Scully was one of the old school play-by-play -play announcers. Vin Scully can paint a picture with words <laughs> such that you're sitting there and he'll tell you stuff you didn't even notice. I know people, I, I tweeted about this this morning. I know people that would go to the game and they'd bring a transistor so that they could hear Scully describing <laughs> the game they were watching. Okay, I know people that watch the game on TV. They turn down the volume, you know, so that they could have Scully explaining it. The guy's a legend. And unfortunately, a lot of today's play-by-play -play announcers grew up with television. So they just assume you're watching the pictures. But there's an entire generation of people for whom words were their stock in trade, okay? And they could describe stuff. I mean, as a writer, I just have such admiration for people who can describe things the way that Vin Scully and Kurt Gowdy and some of those folks did. Um, I'm, how old is Vin now? Anybody know? I mean, he's got to be pushing 90. Yeah. I, I mean, he was old when I was a kid. And he just retired a couple of, a couple of years back, so. Uh, I was Googling it even as we speak. Yeah. yeah oh, uh, I would never do on-air research, never. In this never, case, you have my all. permission. Not at all. <laughs> it's, it's just, I would never do that. He's 92. Yeah, 92 I figured he was like old. around 90. I kind of figured, okay? 92 years. And sharp as a tack, okay? You would like to be as sharp at 90 as he is, okay? It's, it's interesting, though, and I found it a little bit sad talk about the era that we're living in. When he did his little, you know, welcome me to Twitter message, he said, now we're all going to get together and talk baseball, but let's not be controversial. And it's like he had to remind people we're not talking <laughs> politics. Yeah. It, right, how yeah. sad, okay? Because I remember growing up, I had no idea. If the members of the team, whatever team, I didn't know if they were righties, if they were lefties, I mean, who did they vote for? What were their politics? Who cared? All we cared about is, could they hit a baseball? Or could they throw? Or did they have a good slider? You know, or stuff like that. And today, it's all just, well, I won't go see that team because that guy voted for Obama. Yeah, but that guy voted for Trump. And, and I'm like, so what? Who won last night? Okay? <laughs> baseball used to be, and same with football, same with, you know, these used to be the places where we went for catharsis, for escape for an opportunity to just take our mind off of everything and just enjoy watching some talented performers. I mean, I could never be as athletically gifted as some of these folks. And whether they voted for my guy or not, so what? 
So yeah, welcome to the wonderful world of Twitter, sir. You know, <laughs> we're we're glad that Vin is there, and I'm just glad he's still alive. Yeah. Yes, I've never heard a bad thing about Vin Scully. I mean, there, Doug and I, and maybe you also, we've been in broadcasting for a while, off and on. Um, I had more than a four decade career. I met some people that were just total jerks. Okay, if I didn't have to do business with them, I never would have. And then I met some other people that were just the kindest, most down-to-earth people. Vin Scully, I am told, is in that category. I'm told that even though he is one of the most famous play-by-play -play guys in the history of the world, it's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, just nice person. I like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously. Very long aside. Yeah, no, I, obviously for me, like when I think of Vin Scully, I always think back, and it was before my time, the uh, the Kurt Gibson, Homer off of now Red Sox broadcaster, Dennis Eckersley in the uh, in the World Series uh, on, on one leg, basically. So just one of those one of those moments that will that will live on in baseball infamy and in sports infamy, really. So uh, you get a one leg. I tweeted this afternoon about Jim Abbott. Now, oh, I don't yeah. know if you remember Jim Abbott. One arm, one arm, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jim, yeah. Uh, Jim Abbott was born without a right hand. Yeah. And yet from the time he was a kid, he wanted to be a ball player. Now, lucky for him, and he has said this in interviews, I would be lying if I ever said I met him. I never did. But I sure met the kinds of parents that he had. He had parents that were like, you know, no, you're not handicapped. No, you're not disabled. You don't have a hand. You want to play? Fine. It looks like you get a throw with the other hand, right? Okay, so let's learn to do that. And just basically take it as far as you can take it. There was no pressure on him to be a major leaguer. He said, come on, when I was five, I wasn't thinking to be a major leaguer. I was just trying to figure out what am I going to do with the glove? You know, if I want to throw the ball, what do I do with it? And he said, after you practice for a while, it just becomes like second nature. Okay. And gradually he became a role model that he never intended to be, but he became a role model for people because it was like, he never let anything stop him. And the fact that he was able to make it, not only make it to the major leagues, but I mean, one year he won 18 games. He had like, what, a 2.89, I think, earned run average. He was number three in the Cy Young voting. Pitched a no-hitter. Pitched yeah, a no-hitter. Yeah, he pitched yeah. a no-hitter later. Yeah. I mean, but all, all of this with one hand, yeah. okay? Yeah. I know people that can't do that with two hands. <laughs> you know? So, so, yeah, I mean, there are some people, all you can do is just go, wow, you know? I just, my hat's off to you, okay? Is there somebody that you guys find really inspiring? Is there somebody that if you were trying to tell people like, yeah, this athlete, this ball player, wow, this person is relentless, this person is amazing, who would that be? I would actually say, and this is sort of more recent, John Lester. John yeah. Lester, because, yeah. Yeah. you know, here's, yeah, there's a guy fought a battle with cancer, won that battle and just and he sort of has turned it into sort of this mantra of never quit and you know he and you know it's true you know he really just just goes out and just does not only great things on the field but great things in the community i had a chance i remember a few years ago to work at baseball camp that he hosted for kids uh in in the city of boston uh, just a, just an overall really good guy of the game. And, uh, yeah, I definitely say he his just attitude and what he's been able to accomplish definitely, I would say, is very inspiring, without a oh, doubt. Absolutely. Doug, you got anybody? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about baseball, I think it would probably be <clears> – <throat> I'm, I'm going to – the first person that came to my mind was Jim Rice. And I guess the reason Jim Rice came to my mind is because when he started, there was this thing about Boston, um, about, and I know we're talking about it today too, there was this thing about racism in Boston, that nobody wanted to come here because of all the 
<clears throat> all the racism that was happening, you'd hear well, if you were a ball player in the stands. Yeah. Baseball to have a black player. They didn't get right. a black player until 1959. I remember. Right. I'm exactly. Poor baby. Yeah. yeah. And, and so when I, think of, when I think of Jim Rice, I think of somebody who, who I started watching in the 70s when I was growing up, when I was a teenager, um, and even before that. Um, I probably started watching them maybe 77, 78. Um, I guess the first thing that comes to my mind is the fact that my grandfather um, gave us yearbooks and that's the connection I had with him was baseball because he was older and he didn't have a lot of connection to us as, as kids, as grandchildren, but that was his connection. So my first thought is Jim Rice and, and because, not just because of the color barrier, because he's just a genuinely nice guy. And there's a lot of, a lot of, unfortunately today, not everybody, not all the ball players, but there are some ball players that are a little bit of a prima donna attitude. Oh, yeah. And interestingly enough, at the time, there were people who thought that uh, Jim Rice was kind of standoffish. And, right. And it's like, well, yeah, if you were going through some of the stuff he was going through, <laughs> might be standoffish too excuse me yeah i can't even imagine what he was hearing in the field yeah. and, I, and i guarantee you he russell was. of the celtics years later russell too yeah oh yeah some of the stories <clears throat> about what he went through oh yeah i mean not good not yeah good. yeah but definitely talk about but, but i think I, I think jim rice for me would be oh definitely Oh, what brought Rice. that all to mind was the conversation we started having the other night after tom Seaver passed um, for those that have no clue what I'm talking about here, not about Tom Seaver, but about like the other night. Um, on most <laughs> programs, a little inside baseball there. On most <laughs> programs, when you're a new guest, they do a little warm up with you, like they have you come on beforehand and, you know, talk a little bit, not because they don't think you know what you're talking about, but they just want to, which in my case, I don't, but, you know, which <laughs> they just want to get a little feel for like, what's your style, you know, <clears throat> questions can they ask you what's your area of interest that kind of thing so um Tom Seaver had just passed and I mean there's someone who <laughs> there are so many people that have admiration for Tom Seaver okay not only was he a great pitcher but people have said to me he was kind of the thinking man's pitcher I mean he took pitching very seriously. Not only was he good at it, but he was a student of the game. Okay. And he also, he was, he went to college for heaven's sake. I mean, a lot of people associate ball players with just like, oh, they barely got out of high school and that was on an athletic scholarship. And, uh, no. I mean, we've had players that have like master's degrees in the game. Seriously. Um, didn't Breslow have at least a master's um, with the, with the Red Sox? I'm almost, Sure he did, but however you slice Probably. it, um, yeah. however, no, I remember it's hearing him cool. talk one time and I went like, wow. Oh, right. No, really. hey. um, he, he was talking about like he was going to go to medical school and I'm like, you're pitching for the Red Sox, do <laughs> you're going to medical school. <laughs> uh, Mo Vaughn finished his degree. Um, that, remember Mo Vaughn? Oh, yeah. yeah. Of course. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, that most parents were like, you're finishing your degree. This is, you promised this. I don't care how much money you made for the Red Sox. You're finishing your, yes, mom. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, um, Tom Seaver went to college. Uh, I'm told he was a really good conversationalist. I never met the man, but I know a lot of beat writers that did meet him. And they were like, wow, you could talk to him for hours if you wanted to. And he always had something interesting to say. So, you know. It's a shame. I mean, he was only 75, and I gather he had dementia, um, and also COVID, and what a shame. I mean, we're losing a generation of ball players that many people grew up watching, and uh, there you are. Anyway, here I am taking over your show. I apologize. Yeah, no, no. Be on as a guest. No, it's all. It's all. No, it's it's <clears throat> it's it's all good, Donna. It's it's this is what we do. We we converse. We it's called conversation. So as far as I'm <laughs> concerned, that's what you do when you have those. Uh, but um, it's, I, I think it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those situations where 
I used to watch, if you're a baseball purist or a basketball purist or somebody who loves a sport, you're going to watch that sport no matter what. My mother-in-law was bleed, bleeded black and gold. She was at the game in the garden, in the nosebleeds, gallery gods, when Bobby Orr scored that goal. She was there. And she just loved hockey. She used to, if a Bruins game was on, she used to watch college hockey or even high school hockey that was on. Mommy, the, the, the tell me why the Bruins can't win a playoff game? The Beanpot, I don't know. I, I, I w- wish I knew. Um, uh. yeah, I wish I knew why. Um, but again, and, and we took her to no, the I know old... what you're talking about. There are some people. Yeah. I mean, Getty Lee of Rush. The Toronto Blue Jays, I mean, when they were winning, he was a fan. When they were losing, he was a fan. It, I mean, he just loves baseball, loves the Jays. He got me into the Jays, for heaven's sake. <laughs> okay? I mean, obviously, I'm from Boston. I'm a Red Sox fan. But I started following the Jays just to have a conversation, for heaven's sake. Right. You know? And um, they had some really, really good players back in the late 80s, early 90s, when they won the back-to-back World Series. I mean, I, I remember watching Jimmy Key and Tom Hankey and, you know, folks like that, Dwayne Ward. Um, the, the game is different now, though. And I don't want to do the, oh, it was better in the old days, because it was different in the old days. <laughs> but here's something I'm concerned with. And let me ask you, because you're younger than me. Um, Talking about Rafi, right? That too. I'm very <laughs> concerned about the fact that a lot of young people are not being apprenticed into baseball, okay? When I was growing up, I would go to a game. I'd see a lot of young people in the stands, okay? I was not the only one. These days, I know part of it is like the tickets are just outrageously expensive, okay? <laughs> And most of the games are on at night, which I've never agreed with, ever, okay? But to what would you attribute the fact that by and large, most of the passionate baseball fans are older? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good imagination? That, no, no, it's really not coming, because that's, that's the question, I mean, that I and a lot of, you know, big baseball fans keep asking themselves and uh, it's tough because it's true. I mean, there's just, there's just not that excitement from the, the younger generations that, you know, that there, that there once was. And I, I don't, I honestly don't know if I have, you know, uh, I don't know. It's, it's very, maybe, maybe Doug can answer better than I can. Cause well, Robbie, uh, you, Robbie, you actually work for a, a work for a baseball group. Right? I do yeah. baseball right now. Yeah. Is, is yeah. there is there a there's a lot of I'm assuming there's a lot. I don't know how many kids are there, but um, you you would know you're an umpire. You do yeah. you do this stuff. So and you're you're a, you're a baseball purist. You would probably know a lot better just talking to these kids if they're you know obviously they're interested. But I don't know how many kids are there or if there's interest or no. What, there so. there is there's interest in playing you know, the game and there's interest in, you know, being out on the field and, you know, definitely, you know, the numbers for little leagues and things like that are, are still at, I would say, relatively decent numbers. I think that the complaint that you hear just across the board is the length. I mean, I think if I had to sort of point to one particular thing is that just for whatever reason, people, you know, the attention spans have are just – so far so far shorter these days for i don't know what you know again i i don't know the reason for it but i do i do always have always have a professor on your show okay (laughs) marshall McLuhan and doug was in my class when i said this so there will be a quiz um (laughs) i'm getting all nervous now (laughs) no there are a multitude of professors and scholars who have researched this. Marshall McLuhan talked about this back in like the 1960s. And he said that television was making people's attention span much shorter, such that people expected everything to be entertainment, wrap it right up, let's go to the next thing, now there's commercials, you know. And there isn't the patience that people used to have. They want action. 
Okay, in this case, they want home runs. When I was growing up, and again, this is not the good old days. The, no, there were no good old days. There were just different generations, okay? But when I was growing up, it was a much more small ball era. You had somebody that might bunt, somebody that get the runner over. It, it wasn't always like, and here comes King Kong Kelly who's going to hit a home run. You know, it, it just wasn't always like that. I mean, yeah, sure, home runs were great. But you had pitchers who, by and large, went seven or eight innings, okay? Sometimes they did a, the entire complete game. It was expected. And you didn't have to slow down every five minutes for, you know, they had to bring in another pitcher and then this and that. And in fact, pitchers, everyone knew pitchers couldn't hit, but they didn't have a designated hitter back in those days. So, hey, you had a pitcher come up every now and then they'd surprise you. Right? Tim Wakefield was actually a pretty good hitting pitcher, but that's another story. My point is that what, what has changed is expectations. Let's use the internet as an example. Now, for those of us that are seeing this show, they're seeing it online for the most part, okay? Now, that was science fiction when I was growing up. The idea that you could like, oh my God, I can see this on my phone. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, you can see it on your phone. Go back and watch Star Trek. Um, <laughs> today, the expectation, I remember the 1990s, I'd wager you do too, Remember AOL and some of these other services where something would download, it would make this really long, and it would take like 20 minutes of your life for something to download. And you didn't complain because you had nothing to compare it to. Like my students always ask me when they hear an old radio show or watch an old TV show, oh my God, the quality on this is awful. Uh, no, not back in those days, because you were like, You're lucky to hear it. Oh my God, is there this wonderfulness in the world? You know, people didn't even, they had no expectation. Today, if I'm trying to download something and it takes more than 10 seconds, it's like, you know. So I think baseball is like that too. Baseball used to be like you went to the park, you ate your popcorn, you drank your whatever it was you were drinking, and you watch the game, you watch the athletes, the sights, the sounds. It took about two hours and then you went home and you were just really happy. But today it's kind of like, I've been sitting here five minutes and there hasn't been a home run. You know, just different expectations. And in a culture with a short attention span, where there's so many choices, where you can just with the, you know, just your browser, like, oh, I don't like this podcast. Let's try another one. I don't like this webcast. Let's try another one. Growing up, I didn't have all those options. There weren't 500 channels. There weren't 90,000 options. And I was just real pleased to have this. I mean, God, this was amazing to me. This as in going to the game or being able to watch it on TV, that sort of thing. So I really do believe the expectation of the fans has changed. Like why is football more popular than baseball? Okay, when I was growing up, it was the opposite. It was baseball that was popular. The, the, the Patriots, you kidding me? When the Patriots came along, the empty seats at the stadium, I mean, hello. But today, you can't get seats at, at Gillette to get, no, you're not going. So everything is, you know, I understand times change. But I don't think baseball has really addressed what fans want today versus what they wanted years ago. And the tinkering that they have done has almost kind of like changed the game. There's nothing wrong with the game. Uh oh. <laughs> don't, don't get Robbie started on the purest thing. Uh, but yes, yeah, so he, 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 I understand that things change. I'm not talking about that. I right. understand that even when I was growing up, the game was the game but they still tinkered with it. I mean, come on, there wasn't a big deal with relief pitchers, okay? Now it's like everybody's got not just a closer, but somebody who sets Set up, up yeah. the closer and somebody who sets up the setup guy who sets up the closer. <laughs> but I, I know, I just feel like there's something about baseball itself that is really wonderful. And I would hate to lose that. I really would. 
I, I, I will say this. I draw the line at them putting runners at second base and extra innings, but that's the top. Those, those kinds of things. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I but, think they're trying yeah. too hard to make it like, oh, my God, people want action, so we'll <laughs> action. Yeah. It's, well, it's interesting because, obviously, you know, growing up a, a big Red Sox fan, obviously the, one of the big things about being a Red Sox fan is this just – hatred that you're born with for a certain team from uh from the bronx there uh that i will not name uh <laughs> does the team begin with the letter y as in yeah. why are we talking about this <laughs> no, but, yeah but just it's, it's it's interesting because you made me think of it is that even that rivalry even the red sox yankee rivalry like when i was growing up you know in the 90s and even in the early 2000s i mean it was just it was just the, the biggest thing ever. And I just feel like, yeah, it's still a big rivalry, but I just feel like it's lost some of that, some, you know, especially over recent years, it's kind of lost some of that luster to a lot of people. And it's disappointing because like I said, you know, when I was growing up, you know, if you saw a Yankee, I mean, you saw somebody wearing a Yankee hat walking down the streets of Boston, you know, there, there were, there were things being said. Uh, there were, I mean, there were, <laughs> there were, there, well, I mean. I think that there's something else too, and I'm, I, forgive me for interrupting. No, no, no. I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. yelled at for doing it, and my <laughs> apologies. Um, there's something else. I was just reading something earlier today about Cal Ripken. Now, you know, and I know, that there are very few players who did what Cal Ripken did. Okay? I mean, oh, yeah. seriously. <laughs> I mean, that Iron Man record, I mean, what, what was it? Like, uh, God, how many, how many games did he play consecutively? It was a 2,101, I think. Yeah, and some, there were a few more major. after that. Oh, yeah. It started oh, yeah. in, like, May of 1982, and it ended in, like, September of 1995. Yeah. I don't know what's your point. My point is, <laughs> Ripken was around for years. Today... We're almost kind of like rooting for laundry because like a lot of the players, it's like every year they go somewhere else or they True. go somewhere yeah. else. They're trying to get a better yeah. deal. Yeah. I, I hate to keep coming back to when I was growing up, <laughs> but even into the seventies and eighties and even to some degree before the player strike of the nineties, there were players that you knew were going to come back. You knew they were going to be there. You knew that they were there for you. Like thinking about the Celtics back when I was watching them. I mean, Havlicek wasn't going to be there for five minutes. Okay. He was going to be with the team. Okay. When I watched the Celtics in the fifties and the sixties, you had Tommy Heinsohn. You had Heinsohn and Luskatov at the forwards, Russell at center, Sharman and Kuzi at the guards. Okay. And they were there for Sam Jones, Casey Jones. They were there for years. Now, agreed, sometimes people got traded, trades are a part of life. But by and large, when you bond with a player and then the next season they're gone, yeah. you know, I think it makes it harder. I think that the Cal Ripkins of the world, the fact that they had such longevity with their team helped the fans to bond with them, to feel like, well, these really are our guys, you know, they're, they're from our neighborhood. And I don't see that as much either today. No, not at all. So, I mean, look at just perfect example, Mookie Betts. I mean, yeah. you know, going, Oh God, I, I understand he was trained. That broke my heart. Yeah, it broke mine too. Believe me, believe me. I mean, and listen, I understand that they traded, but then to see him sign that huge contract with another team, it's just <laughs> like, it, uh, it just, it, it, yeah, it was. I, but that's it. If you're a kid growing up and you have bonded with your favorite player and they have a great year and then they have a great another year and then they're gone. Yeah. You just got to know them and now they're gone. So I just, it's become, to me anyway, it's become a lot more of a business. It was always a business. But I think that there was an understanding that you got to let ki let people have roots in the community. You got to let players be from here, even if they're not really from here. 
I mean, you know, in the case of Ripken, he was from there. He was from the greater Baltimore area. But these players, I mean, they come and they go. And that's not just the Red Sox. That's just, that's a trend. And I'm not sure it's a good one. Yeah, that's why guys like Paul, like, you know, you're talking about the Celtics, Paul Pierce is, I mean, such a great recent example of someone who actually, you know, stayed with the team through thick and thin and just yeah. was. Oh, and was, David Ortiz with the Yeah, Reds. yeah, yeah. I know he came here, you know, via free agency, but he basically, you know, set his roots in Massachusetts, in go. Boston. And, into the community. Yeah. Such that, I mean, you couldn't go anywhere without seeing Big Poppy. I mean, they Tim Wakefield, too. Tim yeah. Wakefield. Yeah. Tim Wakefield the same way. I love Tim Wakefield, okay? I think he was very underappreciated. Seriously. I will <laughs> go on record as saying that. I agree. Well, it's on record. One of my favorites. I yeah, love he was him. great, yeah. He was wonderful. He was a great pitcher. And anybody um, who could throw a knuckleball, what can I say? Okay? Uh, <laughs> and, and, threw it, and threw it well. Yeah. And threw it well. There, oh, yeah. there are guys out there that can throw a knuckleball. They don't throw it like he does. No. Yeah, like, like no. that's his first pitch. No. And it's pretty much his only pitch. Not at all. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> not, well, not too many I guys out there like that. Watching Hoyt Wilhelm. And uh, he was. Heard the name. Oh, yeah. yeah. Same. The Orioles. <laughs> And he was a knuckleball pitcher, and I remember hitters talking about how you mentally prepare for a knuckleball pitcher. It's like you go up there, I remember a quote, you go up there and you go, I'm not going to swing too soon. I'm not going to swing too soon. I'm not going to swing too soon. I swung too soon. Okay? Because it just, it can't, it's very, it's a very deceptive pitch. And you're mentally saying to yourself, I'm going to wait this one out. And before you know it, it's by you. And you're like, how did that even happen? So, <laughs> yeah. So Wakefield was like that. When Wakefield was on, when he was pitching well, when he had control of that knuckleball, oh, my God, you couldn't hit it if, you know, if you had a, it didn't matter what you had, okay? It just, you couldn't hit it. So, yeah, I have such admiration for people that have that mastery over that pitch. Hard pitch to throw. <laughs> I uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're going to ask me some questions, and here I am hijacking your show. I'm a horrible person. <laughs> you're not. You're not, <laughs> you're not hijacking. Oh, it's, I, it's, I, it's, I, it's all good. This is, Robbie, this is what we do, man. This yeah. is we just I actually, I, I, ha I have one more question. Yep. That came you do my, have. And, Robbie, uh, Robbie, and then, Robbie came prepared. Yeah, and I and then, and then I then I will hand it, back, hand it back over to Doug. Uh, you you know you were talking about you gave such a great earlier uh, such a great synopsis of sort of some of the great traits about sports broadcasters, and I guess I was curious that sort of brought to mind the question. You know, today you know obviously in Boston sports, you know we've sort of had you know some uh, broadcasters who have stayed around for a long time, and some who are sort of new on the scene in Boston. So I was just sort of curious, who are some of the, the better Boston sports broadcasters? It could be now or it can be, you know, throughout the years that, that you've seen, Donna, that have sort of come through, you know, any of the, uh, of the Boston sports for that matter. Well, I had the um, privilege, and some people are going to be laughing their tushies off when I say this, but I had the privilege of listening to Johnny Most calling the Celtics games. Okay. And, if you oh. never heard the late great Johnny Most calling a Celtics game, every single play was like this. It was like this, and it was like, it was like this. that was John. He always sounded like somebody had lit his tushy on fire. And in fact, there was a game when someone he dropped an ash. He dropped a cigarette. He dropped a cigarette. <laughs> yep. Yes, it's the yep. famous cigarette oh. game. It's oh. not, not not a good thing. <laughs> yep, but um, but no, he was uh, he was an acquired taste, but he was a homer. You want to talk about somebody who bled the Celtic green? Didn't matter. Celtics always good. Other team, a filthy, dirty play, but yeah, exactly. Like, uh, dude, you just your your guy just the same thing. Doesn't matter. And, um, he started but, it. Oh yeah, last play. But yeah, if you can ever go on YouTube and find some Johnny Most, you know, how would Jack stole the ball? Yeah, it's Johnny Most was just one of a kind. He really was. 
Um, I grew up listening to Kurt Gowdy back when he was here in Boston. And his sidekick was a guy named Bob Murphy, said Donna, reaching for her collection of stuff. This is a 1958 Red Sox yearbook. Wow. Um, my first <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. And if it exists, Auntie Donna probably has it. And um, Kurt Gowdy's sidekick was a guy named Bob Murphy. Now, shameless plug. Aren't you writing is, something, Donna? There is a new book. <laughs> yes. There's a new book coming out. It's called uh, The New York Mets in Popular Culture. And I have a chapter in it. And the chapter is about Bob Murphy. Kurt Gowdy had a sidekick. It was when I was growing up. It was Kurt Gowdy and Bob Murphy. And I did not know anything about Bob Murphy till years later. I didn't know that he came from Oklahoma. I didn't know how he came to Boston, the Gansa Magilla. And I wrote a chapter about his years before he became the longtime Mets broadcaster. So if any of your viewers are Mets fans or listeners, uh, they should be able to get that uh, book about the New York Mets in popular culture. The editor is David Krell, K-R-E-L-L, -L, available for pre-order wherever you pre-order books. <laughs> um, said Donna, hoping that you'll uh, go to an independent bookstore and keep them alive during the pandemic, because we like independent bookstores. But here also from my personal collection is the Baltimore Orioles 1961 yearbook. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why, Donna? Well, because when Bob Murphy left, he left for a better job after he was never going to be the lead announcer in Boston. That was always going to be Kurt Gowdy. And he had a chance to go to Baltimore and, you know, just make a name for himself, not knowing that the team sponsors would ultimately decide that they wanted somebody else, but that's another story for another time. My point is, late at night, AM radio, the signals would come in from other cities like gangbusters. And I could tune in to WBAL in Baltimore, even though I was sitting in Boston, and I could hear Bob Murphy, who I had grown up with, calling play-by-play -play for the Baltimore Orioles, which was incredibly cool for me. Oh. So, so there you go. So like, yeah, I have a whole collection of like my favorite announcers, where they were, what they were doing. And then I write biographical sketches about them. Um, a lot of the stuff that I write about these days is about the Negro Leagues. Because if you want to talk about an entire area of sports that doesn't get the attention it deserves, the baseball writers who covered the Negro Leagues. And I just got a new bio up about uh, Frank Fay Young. Frank Young was, by all accounts, the first full-time Black sportscaster, sports writer. And going way, way back, he wrote for the Chicago Defender. He had like a four and a half decade career as a sports writer. And most people today, so uh, I'm one of a multitude of people who want to make sure that these folks are remembered because without them, we wouldn't have Negro Leagues history. So where Frank Young was a sports writer, I believe I erroneously said sportscaster, he did get on the air later in his career, but he mostly was a sports writer. And I also wrote about Jocko Maxwell, who was the first black sportscaster going back to 1929. And you want to know something that's a sin? Jocko Maxwell had a four decade career on the radio in New York, broadcasting, commentating, interviewing. I mean, he didn't just do Negro Leagues. He did like the white teams, people, the players came on his shows. He was like, people bowed before him. He never got paid. Wow. White people at the station got paid. He never got paid. Wow. He worked at the post office to support himself. And by the way, the post office was one of the few major places, major organizations that even during segregation, 
hired people of color and gave them an entree into a middle class life. So Jocko Maxwell worked at the post office and then he did play by play and he did interviewing and he had a commentary show in New York and I mean, four decades. And if I said Jocko Maxwell to most people, they'd be like, who? Or Frank Fay Young, who? So those of us at Sabre are trying to make sure that those good folks get remembered as they should. That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> Doug, he's yes. still with us. <laughs> I am. I'm just, I'm, I'm riveted. I'm just, I am well, definitely with the tears. Am I right? <laughs> no, no, you're not. You're not. You're not. You're not no. Um, By the way, you know, a was... wonderful book. This is called Here's the Pitch. It's the amazing true story of baseball and advertising. Okay. Oh boy. And this is a wonderful book. And um, I find this kind of stuff fascinating. It just came out last year. Uh, University of Nebraska Press, Roberta Newman, and I've read her stuff before. Um, it's all about how in order to survive in sports, the play-by-play -play folks had to be pitchmen. They had to like sell beer and, you know, sell cars and sell this and then, like doing the play-by-play -play wasn't enough. I mean, the only way Jocko Maxwell got paid at all was he did sponsor type stuff, but a lot of the other folks, even the ones that were getting paid, they used their products that they sponsored and they became identified. I mean, I remember Kurt Gowdy doing Narragansett beer and the Atlantic refinery, you know, which was a gas station. Atlantic keeps your car on the go. You know, I still remember the jingles, um, but I probably shouldn't sing them. So my point is that, yeah, this is just a fascinating book about how in order to survive as sports announcers, you had to sell products. And uh, so that's the kind of research that fascinates me. And there are a bunch of good folks doing that research today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, wanted to, be wanted warned, to be warned. Just want to warn you. Okay. The new semester for Lesley University, which kindly pays me, is about to start up. And I am up to my ears in syllabi research and a whole host of other stuff. So Absolutely. we may have to wrap this in a couple of minutes. And if I haven't totally alienated you, I'll be happy to come back for part two. Oh, of course. I mean, we'd love to have you back. Absolutely. But yeah, I've been, I've been watching the time in the corner too, though, and I'm making sure that I know we had discussed this. Time. So that's no. Yeah, I, I'd love to talk indefinitely. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you're so paying right, me by the word, but no, no, <laughs> of course. Well, Robbie's going to pay you by the word. Um, I was going to pay you by the sentence, but he said by the word is better. Um, so I said, okay, you pay. Um, no, I just wanted to um, get a, a sense of since we're wrapping it up a little bit right now. I wanted to get a sense of we do a final thought. At, at the end of our show, and it could be any thought whatsoever, whatever's on your mind, uh, current event, whatever. And what we do is we kind of throw it out there and we, we each kind of do one. If we have a guest, we ask them if they have a final thought. If you don't have a final thought, that's okay. Um, I can't imagine that Donna Helper doesn't have a thought, Ed, because I do. Um, so I uh, wanted to know, uh, Donna, what your final thought for the evening would be. Well, I just found a quote and I thought it was an interesting quote. It's from Ursula Le Guin, the uh, science fiction writer. And it says, mm -hmm. you cannot buy the revolution. You cannot make the revolution. You can only be the revolution. It is in your spirit or it is nowhere. Now, the reason that appealed to me is because we're living in a time, and that's an actual quote, it's not one of those fake quotes you see online, rule number one that I tell my students always, fact check the quote, because social media is filled with, I can't believe so-and-so said, and then you look and it's like, no, they didn't say anything like that, okay? Um, but in this case, yeah, it comes from a, a book 1974 and a short story. Um, 
But the reason I liked the quote is there's a lot of people out there complaining and waiting for someone else to do something about it. And my attitude has always been, yeah, there's a lot of stuff wrong in society today, but what are you doing about it? Sitting on Twitter and sending out mean tweets isn't doing something about it. Sitting around with your friends and having one and talking about what a crappy society it is isn't doing anything about it. So if you go to my Facebook page, you'll notice there's a quote on it and it's kind of similar to what I just read to you from Ursula Le Guin. Um, it says, it's, it's from the Talmud, which is a book of commentaries on the Bible and you don't have to be religious to get into it. It says, it's, it's from Pirkei Avot, the ethics of our ancestors. And I teach ethics, so I'm always thinking about ethics. It says, you are not expected to complete the task, but neither are you expected to walk away from it. So, yeah, you can wait for somebody else to be the revolution. You can wait for somebody else to complete the task. Or you can just take on your little corner of the world and do what you can to make things better. Is there someone you can reach out to? Is there someone you can show some kindness to? Is there someone you can take to a game when we're, you know, back up and running again? Is there someone you can do a little volunteer work with? Is there somebody who's lonely and you can give them a call? It may not seem like much, but everything has got to start somewhere. I hate to see us deteriorate into our dueling camps of like, my team's better than your team, so e. Nah, we're all humans. We're all here together. It may not seem like it, but we all do inhabit the same planet. I'm happy to be able to talk sports with people. It's wonderful to do it. But I also want to talk about how can we find some common ground? How can we work together and make this society a little bit kinder, a little bit more compassionate, and a little bit more ethical? That's all I can. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not following that up, Robbie. It's you next. Uh, boy, that would that would that's a. What's tough your act final to thought? If you can, right if you can come up with it. <laughs> no, I guess, you know, I, guess, I just want to thank you for having me on your show. I hope I didn't like dominate it or take it. No, away. no, no, no. This. Was, I'm not doing. I'm not doing a humble brag. I'm saying I'm talent. I'm your guest. I mean. Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. No. Me no, on to like take over the show. Oh, no, it's all good. It's all good. It was. It's all good. It was no fantastic. Worries. It was fantastic having you, and uh, I just, I just wanted to say we were talking about earlier. I mean, obviously, you know, Tom Seaver uh, passed away earlier this week, and uh, I know, you know, the we at the Sports Split send our condolences and our thoughts to uh his family and to you know Mets fans everywhere and uh yeah it just was a really talented pitcher and uh had a great career and um you know definitely uh it's a shame to you know shame to see him go but uh left left behind quite the legacy in the baseball world so just wanted to yeah not not a big final thought tonight but I uh, just uh, wanted to say rest in peace to, like I said, the legendary Tom Seaver. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the other little thing I would say, and I said this on social media, um, I really recommend letting people know you love and care about them while they're still here. Because, <laughs> you know, in the case of Tom Seaver, yeah, most of us don't know the guy, okay? We've read about <laughs> him, maybe we know some beat writers. But unless we're sportscasters, we probably aren't hanging with these folks. But we are hanging with other folks. Yeah. And maybe they need a kind word in times like, I mean, we're in the middle of a damn pandemic, kids. You know, <laughs> maybe there's some people that could use a kind word. Maybe there's somebody that could use to just like get up on Zoom with them and like talk about some of the games they used to watch and this and that. They might appreciate it little trip down memory lane, you know, might be fun, but tell people you care about them now while they still can appreciate it. So I just want to say thank you very much for having me on your show, and I appreciate the opportunity, and I hope I was okay as a guest. 
Excellent. Well, yeah, Excellent. Definitely, you, definitely. And my final thought is the fact that um, I, I don't know if I've ever told you, and I'm going to cavell a little bit, and I apologize if it's going to going to make you uncomfortable. I hope it won't. But um, you were very incredibly instrumental in making me love what I do and what I have done since I have taken your courses, since I took your first course, which is to love mass communication. Um, you have you have taken what I have done my whole life and put it into a different perspective by having a conversation and, and being there. And if I say, hey, Don, hey Donna, how you doing? Let's go have lunch somewhere. Legal seafood is the best place. Um, something like that. Um, those kinds of things are so important. And you always... Every single class, you always told us to do exactly what you just said, which is to go and 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 say hello to somebody, go and go and talk to somebody, go and do this, go and do that, um, something good in the world. And I just want to say it's been a pleasure to have you on, Donna. Yeah. And the fact is, is that you have touched, and I have talked to other Emersonians that had you at Emerson. Um, the fact that when you went to speak at in LA at the um, star on on the on the on the ground uh, for okay. Rush, yeah. Um, yeah, the 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 uh, the the star that Hollywood they put Walk down there, the Hollywood Walk of Fame. All you have to do is you have to YouTube this because when you YouTube it, all you hear in the background is people saying. Donna, Donna, Donna. And the reason that they're saying that is because those are Emersonian students who live in LA, who knew you were going to be there, who wanted to just catch a glimpse, not just of Rush, but of Donna Halper. And this is why, this is, this is why I am part of who I am today. I went to school later in life, but still, you were an incredible influence on how I move forward. And we, I just want to thank you. Trying my best here, you know, trying to do a mitzvah wherever I can. Absolutely. Gentlemen, one must go. Thank you for the kind yeah. words. I'm not sure. Thank I you. Donna, thank you so thank much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so yes. much. Let's Absolutely. do this again sometime. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's fabulous. Thank yes, you so thanks. much. Let me know you when it's up and let me know what the link is so I can... Uh, Give you a little bit of uh, publicity, and I will. I will. I will. Definitely Definitely will. Appreciated the absolutely. Thank, thank you. Thank you so I much. Sports, I really. Do. Absolutely, and we'll have you on again too. Absolutely. Donna. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Donna. Love you guys. Too. Thanks, Donna. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Donna. <laughs> what a what a terrific uh, guest, and I mean, just uh, quite, I, I have quite, I have no words, uh, Robbie. I have no words. Quite the pleasure to uh, have Donna on our show. Uh, I mean, just, you know, this is what, you know, having basically just met the woman, you know, two times now, you know, the other <laughs> night when we did our little uh, pre-show production. Yeah, pre-game, no you know, pre-game. The, and uh, tonight, I mean, she is just a class act and, you know, just an amazing guest to have on. And, you know, just, I, I learned so much just in those two, encounters uh that i could that i could ever hope for so there's, there's so that, much robbie there's yeah. so much knowledge there's so much she knows and that's why i want to take every class that she had um because she's the kind of teacher that you remember for a yeah. lifetime you know when, when you're sitting and you're you're um you know you're remembering the old days whatever the old days are you remember the old days and you go oh who was your favorite teacher who was your favorite professor well guess what Dawn is on my list. And she has, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not blowing her horn. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. As you can tell, she is very modest about what she does. Yeah. She has an incredible amount of knowledge, especially about sports. And that's why I wanted her on this. Yeah. Because especially about baseball. And baseball is is not a forgotten sport, but if you listen to sports radio these days, they're saying, is it still gonna be around? Is it still gonna be the way it was or is it going to change and people are going to move away from it and 
all this unrest that's going on in the world and, and how are we going to do this and, and that kind of thing. So the fact that not only does she study it, but she's a historian and she studies this stuff, very knowledgeable and she's uh, just one of those people that, that once you, you, it's like we had the baseball 101 class. That's yeah. exactly what it was. Baseball it was, and sports it was, broadcasting it was, 101. It was great. Broadcasting 101. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, it just, just wild. Just so very wild. And um, I'm just, just super glad to have her on. Hopefully we can have her on for part two um, sometime down the road. But um, absolutely. Just, um, just, just a great, just, just a great show. Yeah. Great show. Um, and I, you know, I, I do hope that we have her on sometime down the road and oh. we, we have our, we don't have plans to do that yet, but I'm sure she'll, uh, she'll, she'll be fine with uh, coming back on again. Absolutely. Um, I just, I mean, wh what did you think about that? Just the history was just incredible. It was, it was fantastic. I mean, you know, just to, to listen to some of these names that I had heard of and some of these names that I'm not from not as familiar with and you just you felt like you really got the full picture of who these people were from listening to her you know to discuss it uh and like i said who's just uh you know she is such a historian and such a master of you know just the history of sports broadcasting and baseball and all these things i mean you know i i I did not go to Emerson, and you know, I did not have the privilege of taking a, a course with this with this woman. I, I would I would take every course that I possibly could with her after you know, exactly what interactions I did. with her. Yeah, yeah. Would, even if I didn't have to take it, I took it anyway. It uh, was as a distribution, just because she's just that kind of person. She's knowledgeable, but she wants to know what your opinion is, and that's very rare for a professor these days. Typically, what they do is they, they give you information, they stick it on the board, and they hand you a test. It's multiple choice, or it's or it's um, uh, it's um, uh, it's one, one, or one word, no, just one oh, yeah. word answers. Oh she yeah, never did that. Yeah, she yeah. did it a couple times because she had to as part of what she had to do for the course. Typically, her tests were all about essays. Yeah. We talked about sports broadcasting. We talked about this particular, we talked about Bob Murphy. What did you think about the era of Bob Murphy? What did you think about how he went about doing the sports broadcasting? What, and you had to write a paragraph. Yeah. She wanted to know about how much, that's how she knew that you knew the material. And having the conversations, discourse, it was all about discourse. Yeah. So that's, that I think this is what we, what, what we need to do these days. We have to have discourse between all of them. Civilly. Civil, yes, civil yeah. discourse, of course. Um, to be able to talk through some of the stuff, some yeah. of the stuff that's going on these days, but just I, I had so much in the sheet, Robbie. It's not even we didn't even get to not even half of it, and it was, it was, it was fantastic. You know what? It was fine that we didn't because it was a fantastic hour of just reminiscing slash just talking sports. And that's what we do here on the sports blitz, that's we right. Talk sports and we talk about how the Celtics and Raptors are tied at 95 with four minutes to go uh, <laughs> in game three. Yes, I'm multitasking a little bit here. Yeah, uh, I was just about to mention that, but you caught me before I did. But uh, no, I think it, this was, this is a great, this is a, was a great episode and uh, I really hope to have her on again. And, uh, you know, we got, as Doug, I'm sure you're going to mention here coming up. We, you know, we got some more great stuff coming up for you. In, in future episodes, you know, as we roll on down the road here. We certainly do, and uh, very much looking forward to those future episodes. But, uh, you know, certainly uh, take a listen to this one if you missed it. Um, and uh, this one's going to be – this one's going to go down as, 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 a, as a great episode, but one yeah. of the – certainly one of the great ones that we've had. Yeah. Um, but, hey, listen – I, we had a great episode. Uh, we thank everybody. Um, uh, and uh, this is uh, the Sports Blitz with episode number 53. Next week, we're going to have, obviously, episode 54. Um, yeah. And uh, we'll have some other great stuff for, for you to listen to and to see. Um, and um, 
that's that's all I got. That's all I got. Yeah. Thank you again to Donna Helper for uh, yeah. Her thanks, job to Donna Helper yeah, for many, stopping many, by. Many many thanks to Donna. Um, Absolutely. Much, much Absolutely. appreciated. And thank you, Doug, as always, for being here. And pleasure to. Hang out with you as always, vir you know, virtually. And, yes, uh, absolutely. And, and listen, everybody have a great uh, Labor Day weekend. Yeah. It's Labor Day already. It doesn't feel like um, it at all. It does no, not it doesn't. Like Labor it Day doesn't. at all. It doesn't. Um, and the people that are under a rock or in a cave are not even going to know it's Labor Day, so we have to mention it. Um, so um, uh, everybody have a great long weekend, yeah. and we will talk to you next time. See you, everybody.